Good morning and welcome to our service. It is so lovely to have you here on this very wet and miserable morning. Mm -hmm. But as Jill said when she came in the door, she said we praise God in all situations. <laughs> so we praise him this morning that we are able to come. We're small in number. I can understand that many people would have wanted to keep out of that rain. But we join in the name of the Lord and we have people with us on Zoom as well. And we pray you're blessed and also those who will watch later on YouTube. We thank God that in the Holy Spirit we are all together, all one, one body. Why don't we pray as we start. Father God, we thank you so much that uh, even the weather reminds us that the changing of the seasons is something that you had put forth, uh, something that you are in control of, something that you are aware of. And uh, we thank you for the rains. Uh, the ground needs the rain as much as it needs the sun. So we thank you for that. And we pray your blessing upon those who can't be with us today. Be very close to them. Keep them warm and dry. And let them know your presence by the power of your spirit. And be with us, Lord. Be with us as we gather in your name, singing your praises, giving to you, hearing from you, and lifting our prayers to you. Father God, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your mercy and your grace, and we thank you for our Saviour Jesus. And we bring all of our prayers in his name. Amen. Amen. We're going to read some words of scripture together. Psalm 116, verses 1 to 9. Let's read together. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Amen. Amen. I love that line, where is it now? Return to your rest, my soul. What a beautiful line for the psalmist to have written. So we are not only encouraging each other as we read these words, we're encouraging ourselves. We're speaking into our own lives. Return to your rest, my soul. So I pray that anybody who is listening, anybody who even isn't listening, uh, but Father God, that you would return their soul to a place of rest and peace. What a beautiful, beautiful line God has blessed us with this morning. So we are going to sing, Oh happy day, let's stand and sing together. Oh happy day, that fixed my choice on thee, my saviour and my God. Let's stand and sing together.
Stop, which is a wonderful, joyful, happy song, and I love it. But he taught me how to watch and pray and live rejoicing every day. It is very hard to rejoice every day because life is difficult. We've all got stuff that um, is going on. And even as Jill walked in the door this morning, Jill was saying, you know, we're going to praise the Lord. Even though it's lush and raining, we're going to praise the Lord. And uh, sometimes you have to do that. You have to actively decide, I am going to live a life that rejoices every day. It is not easy. And it doesn't mean this kind of, uh, kind of just happy, happy smile that doesn't mean anything. Sometimes it's quite a deep joy, regardless of what's going on. But for all the joy that that song brings, there was a challenge there. He taught me. So it didn't happen like that. So there's no pressure. But there is a process where we allow God to teach us every day to watch and pray and rejoice. So let's really um, be encouraged by that and remember that on daily. And I'm talking, my pastor, my very first pastor used to say, if I'm pointing at you, remember I've got three fingers pointing at myself. <laughs> so I am talking to myself as well as everything else. Okay, so some notices for today. <clears throat> if you can make it to the hall without drowning, we will have tea and coffee in the hall after today's service. And this afternoon, four o'clock Facebook Live with Pastor Richard, and then we will um, <clears throat> put that on YouTube as quick as we can after that. Tomorrow at two, open house is starting again. Anybody is welcome to come uh, at two o'clock in the hall. And uh, if, you, if, it's, if you're looking for something that you can just invite somebody to, that you can chat very casually, just about life and faith and everything, that's a great thing to, excuse me, that's a great thing to invite people to. So, any questions, have a chat with Anthea about. Open house starts back tomorrow at two. Tuesday, half two, sisterhood in the hall. And then Wednesday, our prayer meeting and Bible study, the Zoom will open at 10 to seven and we'll start promptly at seven. And am I right in saying that once the clocks change? Yes. Are we ready to? Yes. So then, once the clocks change at the end of March, we will meet in the hall. So that's where the way we're going to go forward. Um, once the clocks change at the end of March, prayer meeting will be in the hall. We've got brighter evenings and hopefully better weather. Um, but for now, for the next few weeks, we will stay on Zoom for our Wednesday night prayer meeting. Uh, next Sunday here at 11, and then there'll be no tea and coffee, but we will have a Zoom fellowship for anybody who wants to join a Zoom fellowship after the morning service, because at four o'clock, we're having one of our Sunday at four specials in the hall. So if you want to invite anybody, please do. We're not taking names for that. We don't need to do that anymore. Just uh, let us know if you're bringing anybody you're free to invite people at for four o'clock next Sunday. Is there anything else on that one? Oh, okay. There we go. I think that's it. So we're going to read from <coughs> God's Word. <coughs> We're going to start in Genesis, chapter 21. <clears throat> I've got the wrong readers up there, so ignore that. Okay, so Genesis 21, verses 1 to 21. So that's page 21. Lots of 21s there for you. Page 21 of the Church Bible. Genesis chapter 21, <clears throat> verses 1 uh, to 21. <clears throat> I'm so sorry, I, I did a Zoom workshop yesterday, all day yesterday, so I, my voice is... Coming to an end. Uh, okay, so Genesis chapter 21, starting at verse 1. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him, as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about me will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw the son whom Hagar, the Egyptian, had borne to Abraham, was mocking. And she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. 
The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also, because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water and the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And she sat there. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of the Lord called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. And then we're going to move on to Galatians chapter 4. And we're going to start at verse 21. From 21 to the end of the chapter. So Galatians 4, that's on page 1171, page 1171. So now we've got Paul writing to the church in Galatia. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Break forth and cry aloud, you who were never in labour, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit. It is the same now. But what does scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. We praise God for his word and we pray our blessing, <clears throat> pray God's blessing on Pastor Richard as he brings God's word to us later on. So we're going to go into prayer now and we're going to specifically concentrate on prayer for our valley today, local prayers. I'm going to leave it open for a few minutes. Those of you who are listening at home maybe can pray for something locally. Anybody here who wants to pray quietly or out loud and then I'm going to bring some prayers that we've had from Simon and Kath and some other local prayers. So I'll just leave it open for a minute or two. <clears throat> just want to pray, Lord, this morning for all the churches that are gathered together in our valley and beyond. And we just pray for them, Lord. We pray for the leadership of all the churches. And we pray for the congregations of those churches. 
And we ask you, Lord, that your spirit will dwell amongst each and every one of us this morning. In Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. 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 Send Dr. Andrew Jessel, who is quite ill with COVID. And we pray, Father God, for him that he will heal him. Yes. yes. As well, Lord, that he may be aware of his infirmity yes. and aware of your presence. Yes. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We pray for our old friend, Peter, waiting on operation for mm -hmm. the rest of the morning. Yes. And I do thank you, Lord, this day for allowing me to be able to go and do the job. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Lord. Good news. Yeah. And yeah. Jesus' name. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father God, we thank you so much for your love and your mercy to us. And we do pray for ourselves, Lord God, that you would continue to bless us as a church. We thank you for keeping us during the pandemic and the lockdown. And we thank you again that though a lot of us have been separated and we haven't been able to join as often or in the way that we would like to, you have been so faithful to us. You, Father, have kept us kept us in contact with one another, kept those who've been ill, kept them well, <clears throat> given them measure of healing, and we will continue to pray for each other and love each other as you have commanded us. We pray, Father, as the weather improves and the restrictions lift, that you will bring us all together again as a church family, that we might be a witness to those around us of the love and fellowship that we have for each other. That people would see us, not us, Lord, but see beyond us to you and your presence and the love that you have given us and the Holy Spirit fellowship that we have amongst one another. And Father, we do pray for many that are in our church family who are struggling with illnesses or recovering from procedures and surgeries. And we thank you for your faithfulness to Keith, Lord God, and we thank you that he's home and that Richard has been able to speak to and others as well I know have been speaking to him and we thank you father for it, that he was able to come home so soon and we pray for him and barbara now during this recovery process mm -hmm. that you'll give them both strength that you give them both wisdom and that they will have all of the help and support they need mm -hmm. that you'll keep keith well and strong and free from any complications of the surgery we thank you too uh, for daniel's recovery from similar surgery and we think of doreen as well all, who is also been recovering from that from those operations and lord god we just thank you so much for your faithfulness that our brothers and sisters have people around them who love them and care for them and watch over them and we know there are many who don't have that in their lives so we're so grateful father for the care of the nhs the aftercare and the love of friends and family 
And Father, we pray for others in our church family who are struggling with long-term conditions. And we ask, Father God, for that all-sufficient grace that you have promised in your word. Amen. And we do thank you again for Rosalind's visit to Malcolm Earl. God. We thank you, Father, for the blessing it was to both of them. And I suppose when we talked about our soul going back to a place of rest, we pray that that visit now will have given great peace and great joy and comfort to Rosalind. Mm -hmm. And Lord, whatever happens next, whatever is the next process and uh, procedures that need to be put in place for Malcolm's care, we know you have both of them in the palm mm -hmm. of your hand. You love them, you are for them, and we pray your blessing in these next steps of Malcolm's mm -hmm. care. We thank you so much for the other churches, as Phil has already prayed. We pray your blessing on them as they meet this morning, as they bring your word to their congregations. And we thank you for the fellowship there is among churches throughout Pontypool and our valley and throughout Gwent. And we pray, Father God, for the churches we're connected to through the Gwent Baptist Association. We thank you for the fellowship that we have. And we thank you, Father, for the support that it gives to Pastor Richard as he's able to meet and uh, share fellowship with other church leaders and we thank you father god we do pray for church leaders in these strange times as we come out of lockdown that you'll give them strength and energy and vision and focus mm -hmm. as to how you will have us move forward mm -hmm. after this strange and difficult season lord god but we thank you again for your faithfulness to us lord god uh, I thank you, Lord, that I was able to make contact with Simon Matheson, and we thank you for his faithfulness and his commitment and his passion for the work of Christians Against Poverty. And Lord, I just pray, Father God, that you will give him all that he needs in this season. I thank you, Father God, that he has had a full diary over the past year, and that the finances have been there in terms of support, and that has been really helpful to him. He's been able to not be concerned about not have to use his time for fundraising he's been able to go out and do the work that you've called him to do meet with people connect with people and start them on their journey to be free from debt and thank you lord god that there have been a handful of very encouraging responses to the gospel recently we thank you for that lord god and we thank you father god for the work of cap in our area we pray father god that those bookings that haven't really taken off, sorry, haven't really taken off. And Simon has said that this happens, that there'll be a flurry of kind of interest and some people just aren't ready to go to the next step. We pray, Father, for those people who have started to make contact, but then almost kind of uh, run back from it. Maybe it's due to fear, maybe it's due to embarrassment. But Father God, we pray that you will give wisdom to Simon as he gently encourages people on their journey to becoming debt free and that you will give him great wisdom and great insight as to how he can help people most effectively. And Father, for the life skills course, which have we started, and we thank you so much for the encouragement that Simon is seeing in the life skills groups. And we pray, Father God, that that will grow, that the work of CAP and the work of those life skills group will move throughout Pontypool and Torvine, mm -hmm. will actually start to make such an impact that people will see that the work of CAP is changing lives in every way, Lord God. Mm -hmm. So Lord, we thank you so much for Simon's commitment, for his hard work, uh, quite often done in quiet, often done um, without uh, any fanfare without being seen or heard of by by anybody just working away with the small team that he has bless him and encourage him for his wife and his family too and their church bless them father strengthen them in every way and continue we ask lord to provide for the work of cap here and across the country father god we thank you so much that we can bring these things to you we thank you for the food bank as well we thank you for uh our, our friends, our dear friends and local churches. And we thank you, Father, that you love Pontypool. You love Torvine. And you want to move in the hearts of people in our area. So help us to be the carrier of your love, the carrier of your grace and mercy. Help us, Father God. We, we don't know how to do it. We will do the best that we can do. Please give us wisdom and a vision for reaching people with your love 
from those who are neighbours across the road to the rest of the town, Lord God. Give us wisdom, we pray. And bless us because we love you. We thank you so much for your love for us. And in Jesus' name, we bring our prayers and our praises to you. Amen. Amen. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. So before Pastor Richard comes to bring God's word to us, we are going to stand and sing together. There's a place where the streets shine with the glory of the Lamb. And uh, this song is all about the fact that we have hope. We have a hope of our heavenly home because of the Lord Jesus. Let's stand and sing together.
thank you again, Anne-Marie, for leading us this morning. It's lovely just to know the Lord's presence as we worship him, isn't it? Let's turn back to Galatians. Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 to 31. Galatians chapter 4, starting at verse 21. Let's pray again as we come to God's word. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word again, which speaks to us, and we pray that we will be those who would have ears to hear what you're saying to us, and give us hearts to obey what you're saying to us. Meet with us by the power of your Holy Spirit this morning, in this place, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, there are many people today who are interested in their heritage, family tree, if you like, where they've come from. In my own family, there's a cousin of mine who, is, who has done quite a lot of work going back in time to find out who was in our family in the past. I don't know whether any of you remember, a few years ago, a TV programme which was called Who Do You Think You Are? And a celebrity would be invited on and... The program would go into their past. And there was always great interest to see if they were related to somebody famous in history. Incidentally, I have to tell you that research into our family tree hasn't yet shown that I'm related to anybody famous. Yet. The thing is, we're interested, aren't we, in our ancestors. We're interested in where we come from. And that is what our passage today is all about. Not our human ancestors, but where did we come from spiritually? Now these verses here are probably the most difficult in the whole of Galatians. There's a lot going on here, and I realise that this morning we're only going to be able to really scratch the surface of what it actually means. And I have to be honest and say this past week has been very busy for me for a number of reasons. And it would be in a very busy week when I have this passage. But then perhaps it's the Lord saying to me that I have to rely on him rather than my own ingenuity to see what he's saying here. Anyway, let's look at these verses. As Paul goes back to Abraham, no doubt the believers here would have heard of that story of Abraham. But this is more than just an illustration. Because Abraham's life shows the pattern that God set in the Old Testament. And so this morning we're going to look at that story and what it means. So first of all, what is the story? What's the story? Well, we read part of it earlier on from Genesis 21, didn't we? We read that God had promised a son to Abraham, and this son would continue in the line that God had promised, which we know would end up in the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. However, Abraham and Sarah were getting older, and the son hadn't arrived. So they became rather impatient and decided to take matters into their own hands. And Abraham had a son with his slave girl, Hagar. However, God made it very clear that this son called Ishmael was not the son of promise. And eventually, in older age, Abraham and Sarah did have a son together. He was called Isaac, and he really was the son of promise. And our passage earlier showed us that these two children grew up 
but there was a bit of bad feeling between Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael was mocking, we read earlier on, didn't we? She, he was mocking Sarah, and Sarah was not very happy about that, and neither was Abraham when he heard about it. And so in the end, Hagar and Ishmael were sent away. But God cared even for them, even though Ishmael was not the son of promise. And then Abraham, Sarah and Isaac continued as the family of promise. And back here in our passage in Galatians, Paul is reminding the believers there of that. And he's using this whole situation as a metaphor for what is going on in the lives of these believers. And so he writes about Abraham and his two sons, by which of course he means Ishmael and Isaac. He talks about the slave woman Hagar and the free woman Sarah, Isaac's mother. And what had happened was, as we said a moment ago, Ishmael and Hagar had been sent away, but Isaac and Sarah stayed with Abraham and enjoyed all the privileges of being a son of promise. Verse 23 says this, His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of divine promise. Paul had already reminded the believers here that they were children of promise. End of verse 22 tells us that. In, sorry, chapter 3, end of verse 22 tells us. The scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin, so that what was promised, being given through faith in Christ Jesus, might be given to those who believe. Through faith in Christ Jesus. That's what had happened to these believers. And Paul here was saying, if you're children of promise, why would you go back to being children of slavery? Because if they'd been listening to the false teachers, they would have gone back to circumcision and other rituals, not be living as children of promise. They would be living as children of slavery. Let's bear that in mind. These two children rep represent the two different ways of being. Children of promise, represented by Isaac. Children of slavery, represented by Ishmael. And let's remind ourselves this morning as well, that as Christians, we're children of God's promise. And as we look before at this epistle, we're to live in the freedom that being children of promise brings. We're not, by our own efforts, somehow trying to please God. Because if we live like that, we are living back in slavery again. What it does mean is we live by faith in Christ and we put our trust in him completely. Because, we'll see this in a moment, the Lord Jesus Christ was the fulfilment of that promise made to Abraham. And then, as we trust in Christ, he gives us the Holy Spirit. And it's by the motivation of the Holy Spirit we live in a way that pleases him. Yes, living as children of promise, I've said this before, it doesn't mean we just do whatever we like. But the motivation for pleasing God is because we are in that relationship with him. We are children of promise, but we're not somehow trying to earn his favour. And so Paul here reminds the Galatians of Abraham and his <laughs> sons. They are children of promise rather than children of slavery. But that brings us Secondly, to ask the question, what does it mean to be children of promise? We read about that here, that we're children of promise. What does that actually mean? He says, at the beginning of verse 24, these things are to be taken figuratively. The women re represent two covenants. Covenant. We've 
come across that word before, doesn't haven't we? What covenant really means is an agreement. For example, if you were to buy a house, you'd have to take out a mortgage. And the mortgage company agrees to let you have the sum of money to buy the house, as long as you pay it back, usually in monthly instalments, which includes interest, of course. But the agreement is made. The insurer, the mortgage company agrees to provide the money and you agree to pay it back. God, we read in the Old Testament, had made covenants or agreements with his people. Here we read about verse 24 again. One covenant is from Mount Sinai. Now Mount Sinai is the place where God had met with Moses and given him the law. It's where God reminds his people that he is their God. In Exodus 20 verse 2, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. God was their God who had loved them and brought them and rescued them from Egypt. And then he promised to be with them and look after his people. That was the promise that God made to them. And the agreement was that God would do that. And in return, his people were to live in a way that pleased him. They would obey the laws. And we look at Exodus 20 and we'll get to that as we go through Exodus eventually, won't we? The laws that God put into place. God's agreement. God's covenant with his people. Agreement was made. And let's be clear about this, that was a good thing. Because God showed the relationship he had with his people. He would be their God, they would be his people living for him. But sadly, as we read through the Old Testament, you find time and time again that the people did not live in that way. But God was always faithful, even though the people weren't. He was always their God who would look after them. And so the covenant was a good thing. An agreement was a good thing. But verse 24 here tells us, end of verse 24, one covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. That is Hagar. What's that about? What's Paul talking about there? We just said the covenant is a good thing. So why then talk about being slaves? Because that is a negative thing. Well, we need to remember the time when God made the covenant with his people. It was a good thing. It showed God's relationship with his people. But the thing is this. Something that happened later, many centuries later actually. Something far, far greater than that happened. The Lord Jesus Christ came into this world. That was far, far better even than that agreement that God had made all those years before. It's because of what he has done. Through his life, his death, his resurrection, that we can now have true freedom. And by comparison with that, by comparison with what Jesus has done, well, the Moses' covenant seems like slavery. And so he paints this picture in verse 25. Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and, cons and, sta and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her, her children. Mount Sinai, a good place. Jerusalem, a good place where God's people went to worship. And yet those good places are considered places of slavery by comparison with somewhere else. Because verse 26 tells us that Jerusalem that is above is free and she is our mother. What's that talking about? The Jerusalem that is above. 
Well, that's surely the place where Christ is now, where he rules and reigns. Because after Jesus rose from the dead, he went back up into heaven. He is now at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning. That is the Jerusalem that is above. That is where we now are, under his rule, under his reign. Colossians 3 verse 1 says this. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. That is where the free Jerusalem is. The Jerusalem above, that is free, that we read of here. We'll be finding out more about that freedom as, God willing, we go into chapter 5 in a couple of weeks' time. So we are to be children of that promise, the promise in Christ, where he is ruling and reigning. But then we have chapter, verse 27. It is written, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Break forth and cry aloud, you who were never in labour, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. What's that about? Well, Paul here is quoting from the prophecy of Isaiah in the Old Testament. Isaiah 54, verse 1. Why does Paul quote that right here after he's just told them there to be children of the promise? Fix their eyes on Jesus in heaven. Why is he now talking about that? Why does he quote that verse? You might think that's out of place, isn't it? Well, the thing is that Isaiah was looking forward. He was looking forward to the time when the promised woman would be born. He was writing to Jews who were in exile to give them encouragement that things would improve, that the Messiah would come. I must say, I like this quote from John Stott. John Stott says this, He likens their state in exile under divine judgment to that of a barren woman, finally deserted by her husband, and their future state, after the restoration, to that of a fruitful mother with more children than so Paul here was encouraging the Galatians that if their trust was in Jesus, they would be part of the family of this fruitful mother. Now the false teachers we've already seen were trying to convince the people otherwise. And here Paul is saying, trust in Christ. Be part of the free Jerusalem that is above. And be part of the family with many others which John Stott calls the fruitful mother with more children than ever. That is what we this morning as Christians are part of that. Let's rejoice today in that. Let's rejoice in all that Christ has done. So we can live in the light of his life, his death, his resurrection. Because the relationship that we have with him now is so much better than that covenant of Sinai. Let's not go back to trying to earn God's favour, no. Let's ask him, by his Holy Spirit, that he will enable us to live in a way that pleases him. And so what does that look like? How do we live in the freedom of the Jerusalem that is above? So we're to be these children of promise. We need to ask how does all this apply to us? What does this mean for our lives? Well, Paul actually reminds the believers here that living in this way is not always easy. Because if we want to live like this, if we want to have faith in Christ, if we want to live in a way that pleases him as children of promise, there will be opposition from others as we do that. Verse 28 tells us, you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. 
Opposition would come. Paul was saying to these people, look, you are children of promise. That is wonderful. But there will be opposition. And that opposition can actually come in two different ways. First of all, opposition can come from those who are not sympathetic to our faith. Those who just don't understand. They don't know the Lord. They don't understand what it means to live to please God. Now, they might not outwardly be nasty towards us, but it can be subtle, can't it, sometimes? People might shut us out of conversations. They might make the odd snide remark. And this we could call persecution from those born according to the flesh. Maybe on a wider scale, it is true to say that many of the values that we as Christians hold as being important are being opposed. And that is opposition, isn't it? We need to pray for those in government. I mean, there are so many reasons at the moment to pray for those in government, aren't there? But <clears throat> there are MPs who have faith in Christ, in all the main political parties, actually. And sometimes, I'm sure it is the case, that party policy for them goes against their conscience. So we need to pray that they will continue to be people of integrity. But on a wider scale too, going beyond this country, we know, don't we, that our brothers and sisters in Christ, in parts of the world, being actively persecuted for their faith. That opposition means facing prison even death sometimes. So let's remember them in our prayers. Let's ask that the Lord will strengthen them and enable them in their situation. But for all of us, let's ask the Lord for wisdom in the situations that we're in, where we receive opposition in some shape or form because we want to live for Christ. So opposition can, yes, come from those who are not sympathetic to the gospel. Those who don't want to follow Christ. That's where opposition can come from. But, and I say this very gently, opposition can also come from some who may well be brothers and sisters in Christ, too. Believers who maybe emphasise the wrong things, making non-essential things to be essential. And let's be clear about this. The gospel, as we know, is all about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. We cannot compromise on that. We believe that Jesus has come into this world. We believe he lived a perfect life. We believe he died on the cross in our place. We believe he rose from the dead to guarantee life forevermore. Those are the essentials of the gospel, and we trust in God as our response to that. As I say, we're not trying to earn God's favour. But then we, as Christians, work with believers who believe that, because we have those essentials. The same, we believe in what Jesus has come to do. But what we find is that there are areas where we differ from brothers and sisters in Christ. For example, in our church here, we baptise believers by immersion on profession of faith. I believe that's a biblical pattern. But there are brothers and sisters in Christ who would disagree with me on that. They will baptise infants. And even though I believe the way that we do baptism is important, it is not essential, as in what Jesus has done. And so we won't break fellowship over that. Now there are some who would, who would say we will only work with people who believe the same thing about baptism. That makes it an essential where it is not. We know too the way our church is governed, don't we? We have a leadership team. And we make recommendations to the church. In the end... The church meeting makes the major decisions. 
as we, as I've said before many times, we seek the mind of Christ together, don't we? Now, there are churches where the leadership team makes the decisions and just tells the church what they've decided. But again, we don't break fellowship with people who do things differently. We need to make sure that our attitude is loving and gracious to one another because the gospel is all about Jesus and what he has done. It is not what Jesus has done plus baptism or what Jesus has done plus church government. Let's be those who keep fellowship with those who are brothers and sisters in Christ. And even with those who might think differently on gospel essentials, we should also be gentle with them too. Because we need to try and show them the gospel so that then they will come to believe in what Jesus has done for us. And so, opposition, yes, it could come from those who don't know the Lord, but it could also come from brothers and sisters in Christ as well. And finally, as we are the children of promise, we're told in verse 30, we are the children of the free woman. We are the ones who have a glorious inheritance. Verse 30, what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. The inheritance as God's children we said this before, haven't we? It is sons who inherit, not slaves. And so because we're children of Christ, because we're children of promise, there is something yet to come which we haven't yet had. And that is the promise of being with the Lord forever. And that's something that we can look forward to. When we leave this earth, whenever that may be, we are guaranteed a place in heaven. Let's rejoice this morning in that. Because that is the inheritance that we have. And so let's thank God for the Lord Jesus Christ. For his life, his death and resurrection has made that future hope possible. God kept his promise in sending the Lord Jesus Christ into this world. And so we can trust him that he will keep the promise for future hope for us. I wonder, do you have that hope this morning? But if not, then you can put your trust in God too. And that will then become a reality for you. That one day you will go to be with him. And for those of us who are trusting Christ, let's be those who live as children of promise. Let us live as those who trust him completely. Who are not somehow trying to earn his favour. He loves you this morning. And here's the reality of it. Let's remind ourselves of this. He loves you because he loves you. He doesn't love you because of anything that you've done or not done. And in light of that love, let's ask him. By the power of the Holy Spirit to enable us to live lives that please him and shows that love to other people and shows that yes we truly are children of promise because in the words of verse 31 therefore brothers and sisters we are not children of the slave woman but of the free woman Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that this morning we are children of promise through what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. And we pray that you'd help us to live our lives in the light of that. That we would seek to please you because of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. 
Help us by your spirit to live in a way that does please him. And Father, when there is indeed opposition to our living in that way, we pray that we would know your help and your guidance. And so we thank you and praise you for your word. Father, we pray you'd help us to understand what it is that you're saying to us this morning. And give us your Holy Spirit to live to please you as children of the promise. In Jesus' name. Amen. stand and sing our closing song loved with everlasting love led by grace that love to know let's stand and sing together Please do have a seat.